everybody. Uh, I'm glad to be there with you, um, unfortunately on distance. So I've recorded my presentation uh, a few days ago uh, because of the poor internet connection. I'm actually now in, uh, in Congo. So I would like to uh, present you the, the pre-recorded presentation and then I will be back to you uh, once, uh, once it's uh, finished in like 20, 28 minutes, I guess. And I will be ready for your questions and remarks. And of course, uh, now when uh, double thinking about what uh, I could have said better or precise, more precise, um, I regret uh, I regret that uh, I didn't include all the information. So if you will have questions, uh, especially about the figures of our projects, about uh, some quantification of the, of the results, uh, I'm here to reply you once, once the pre-recorded presentation is, is finished. So I would like to ask the, the organizers whether they can, they can play uh, and they can screen, screen the recording. Hello, everybody. I hope that you are having a great time back in Czech Republic. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, I regret I cannot be there in person. And uh, please accept my kind and warm greetings from uh, Congo, specifically southern part near Brazzaville. Uh, my today's talk will be on behalf of the organization Safe Elephants, which is a Czech-based NGO focused on uh, conservation and supporting of conservation in Central Africa and uh, on behalf of the Zoo Liberets, which is uh, the oldest zoo in the Czech Republic uh, and our main partner since the beginning of our activities some 10 years ago from now. Uh, my presentation will be divided into three main parts. First, um, regarding elephants, both species, uh, then uh, the so-called bushmeat crisis going on now, and then some specific aspects of the human, human wildlife conflict in Central Africa and some of our solutions. And uh, the talk will be partially a presentation of the known figures and facts in Central Africa and uh, my personal experience from a decade of working, volunteering and traveling in this part of the world. Now, talking about elephants, we have to consider that uh, nowadays there are two species uh, present in the Central African region. One of them, the most uh, better known and most spread it, uh, the bush elephant and uh, recently recognized forest elephants, uh, which uh, this year has been recognized by IUCN as a separate species. Unfortunately, when traveling uh, through Central Africa as an independent conservationist and traveler, uh, it happens that uh, you see more dead elephant carcasses than those uh, which are alive. And the main driver is, as you can guess, the trade in ivory, which is, uh, despite some positive changes in Asia, still the main threat to those elephant populations. And uh, interestingly, the average size of um, tusks today found on the black market worldwide is less than uh, two kilograms. It used to be much, much more in the past, and now it's shrinking because of the heavy pressure, heavy poaching pressure. This map is actually uh, not up to date, but it more or less represents the current uh, distribution of both species of the African elephants combined. Uh, and it also doesn't give us uh, the correct information about the population densities and the total abundance of the elephants in the particular regions. For example, uh, the patch of elephants, of bush elephants in northern Botswana uh, comprise some 130,000 elephants, which uh, is a third of the total African, uh, African population size. Uh, what we know about elephants numbers is not very accurate, but uh, some of the main, main information we have to take into account uh, come from the Great Elephant Census, finalized in 2016, which showed a 30% decrease in elephants population size between 2007-2014 uh, in bush elephants, and then even more dramatically, a 62% decline of the forest elephant uh, numbers between 2002 and 2011. 
uh, when we look in at those figures, we show the pike index, pike meaning the proportion, the proportion of illegally killed elephants, uh, carcasses on uh, African level are um, sampled and estimated which is the cause of the death and it shows that nowadays approximately still half of the carcasses are being poached and when the poaching crisis uh, was uh, culminate, culminating when it was at its, peak, at its peak around 2011 up to seven or eight uh, elephants uh, which have been uh, which have been found uh, dead have been killed illegally by poachers that was uh, at the time when uh, I decided to, to try uh, be active in this um, in this regard and I founded with my colleagues and friends uh, this NGO which is active to to date uh, the main main fight is of course the repression against uh, the black ivory market uh, on this graph and now I see it's in check but you would understand the the, the huge increase in uh, in price uh, showing that uh, on the level of African poacher those guys uh, calling the trigger don't really earn much. Then on the intermediate level, uh, in case of African uh, traffickers, then they can already get quite a lot of money out of it. And the real value of the ivory um, happens when it's, when it's uh, exported out of the continent, mainly to, to the Far East. Those trafficking routes uh, from the, from the EA uh, shows that majority, the vast majority of ivory goes to uh, East Asian countries, mainly mainland China, Hong Kong, Japan, Taiwan. Uh, the role of Vietnam is also increasing. Uh, on the other hand, Western Europe and the US, as it used to be the main important in the past, is nowadays uh, not a not, uh, uh, very important market. And even some of the seizures which uh, I have even made or witnessed in Central Africa shows that uh, the, the ivory coming from Central Africa is clearly signed to the to the African sorry to the East Asian market. Now talking more about some facilitators of the illegal trade, I have to I have to note the logging, which is a legal activity in the Congo Basin. It is happening on the selective scale uh, with average one to two trees being extracted from one hectare which is not a lot but you have to take into account that uh, we got to approach each of the single trees and this means creation of vast road networks this this map shows uh, forestry concessions in the republic of congo where our project is mainly active and those concessions belonging to either Chinese or Malaysian or Singapore companies um, represent uh, more than 55% of the total forest uh, concession uh, area and it represents a big uh, threat to the local elephant and not only elephant populations because of the uh, steady presence of the Asian nationals and the, the presence of the, of the exporting routes and, and so on. And we have witnessed many times, as here for instance, that poachers are using those roads and those uh, logistic means to penetrate to the forest and to evacuate the merchandise out of it. Another big threat is the mining, either legal or illegal, of uh, the resources such as gold or in the eastern DRC, eastern Congo, the Kassiterit or, or other main or important and valued metals and other articles. Uh, it doesn't only mm, represent a threat in terms of uh, human presence in the originally pristine rainforests and those people need to eat something. There is lack of infrastructure of course, uh, but of course uh, the logging or the, the mining activities themselves create a big uh, big degradation of the soil, of the, of the rivers and of course of the forest uh, itself. And now the third main facilitator is the corruption. Corruption may be being the number one facilitator of the trade, uh, as can be he seen here in Kinshasa, capital of the DRC, 
uh, with ivory being totally illegal, but still uh, on the display just several several years ago uh, in the city center. Uh, now, several words about uh, our work in repression. This is a, a screenshot from our from our hidden video video being recorded by ivory traffickers in in Congo a few months ago at the beginning of the year. This is the raw ivory which was on display for for sale. It comes from the forest elephants. This is one of the main trafficker uh, originally. This is an ex ranger from one of the national park here in Congo, who, who is presenting me now the merchandise merchandise myself. Uh, trying to to get more evidence on him and uh, pretending to be interested in in the in the purchase, and now the arrival of the police forces, um, uh, which uh, arrested the suspects. Uh, in total, there were six six, six suspects arrested. Uh, three of them being in the military, uh, specifically the Congolese army uh, and the and the police and the gendarmerie working at the international airport and the, the ex echo guard or ex ranger uh, so those persons were were <clears throat> trafficking uh, ivory out of the country and within the country uh, we've seized uh, 101 kilogram of ivory for some reason the picture is not uh, appearing here for now uh, what's happening with the ivory once it's seized and if it's not uh, re, um, re commercialized because of the corruption, uh, it ends in the, in the state magazines and in some occasions it is uh, being destroyed. As for example here, some five, five years ago in the city center of Drazaville. Uh, this uh, piece is a wonderful source of information about the current trends in, in ivory poaching. Now I will move from the elephant crisis to the species which are being hunted mainly for the, for the meat, for the human consumption. As you can see here on this uh, example, elephants are usually killed purely for the ivory. Uh, the face is hacked off uh, using a machete or a chainsaw and the meat is, is being uh, left without any, without any um, further use. Of course, this might uh, change if, it is, if this is happening uh, close to the village, villages or human settlements. In this case, human civilian population can approach the site of poaching and can uh, cut off the, the entire meat, dry it and, uh, and then use it. But this is happening very rarely because most of the poaching, of course, is happening in the protected areas or on the periphery uh, of the areas with no... Um, steady or permanent human population dried elephant meat in chat uh, seven years ago so i said that elephants are not being killed for meat unlike other species uh, when you imagine all other species talking about mammals birds reptiles amphibians uh, all of them are being used for the so-called bushmeat trade uh, of course, the bushmeat hunting can be something very traditional, something very sustainable, as can be the case of the autochton of the indigenous people inhabiting the Congo Basin, uh, in the case of the Baka, Bayaka or Bagieli uh, pygmies. Uh, they use different, different means of hunting. It can be spear hunting, uh, it can be the net, hunt, net hunting, as you can see here, uh, the whole families, whole communities uh, being at the same time in the forest creating big uh, net networks of the traditionally um, fabricated nets and then chasing small animals such as dikers, uh, porcupines or others for, for subsistence uh, consumption. Uh, species like uh, monitor lizards uh, but even carnivores uh, like a golden cat uh, and others can be more or less sustainably harvested using traditional techniques. Unfortunately, what we see nowadays is uh, widespread use of non-traditional techniques. Uh, 
metallic cables, metallic snares, uh, which which are unselectively catching all sorts of animals, including uh, apes. Sometimes it's a big big danger, and of course uh, firearms. Uh, fire, firearms are um, also as as a heritage of. Uh, Civil war, civil wars, but also due to corruption in the military military circles, available broadly on the Central African countryside, and they can be used not only for hunting small animals such as here, but also uh, to hunt our closest relatives, for instance chimpanzees, bonobos, or, or gorillas for meat. Uh, just a several months old uh, picture of of our little friend in one village in southern Congo who revealed us that uh, that his uncle recently killed a chimpanzee baby chimpanzee cake baby for for a soup the problem is not only that uh, rare and protected and uh, threatened species are being targeted but uh, the main problem is the volume of uh, such uh, com such uh, bushmeat uh, trade because uh, we have to we have to be aware that uh, most of the bushmeat doesn't uh, doesn't feed the local human population, but is being extracted some sometimes in really huge amounts, huge volumes, to the urban centers in Central Africa. For instance, here 400 kilo of partially smoked bushmeat uh, being transported to Point Noir in Congo. Here again, this is a map of the Cameroon, Central African Republic and Congo uh, borders showing the forest concessions and national parks, light, light gray national parks, forest concessions, uh, dark, gray, dark gray, with a vast network of uh, timber logging roads, which facilitates the, the fast evacuation of bushmeat, which is of course uh, decaying by time and the roads, vehicles, motorbikes, cell phones, all of this is facilitating the extraction. So it is no more the local people, local children and local population who is uh, eating most of the bushmeat, but the, the urban population. Uh, the rate of urbanization in Central Africa is particularly high. It accounts to between 60 and over 70% in those uh, countries around, around equator. And the problem is that most of the urban population uh, doesn't have any adequate and any, uh, any alternative uh, source of uh, animal protein available. The domestic animals are rare uh, to, be, uh, to be reared and the import of, uh, of the meat from other part of the parts of the world is problematic, non-economic and of course not ecologic uh, uh, either. So even the the population dwelling in the big uh, big capitals and big uh, centers are still dependent on the bushmeat. Um, it can be also a big threat in terms of uh, disease transmissions. Just uh, less than a year old pictures from uh, outskirts of Brazzaville and Kinshasa in Congo uh, and the chase or the hunting of the fruit bats, fruit bats which are which are known to transmit uh, Ebola virus, uh, coronaviruses, and others. Uh, here, people in public transport wearing face masks, uh, uh, you know, respecting uh, distancing, but carrying the the cages with with freshly hunted fruit bats to the local market. Of course. Uh, the bushmeat is being prepared in a in non non adequate uh, manner at and it can be it it can be seen or we can we can see that uh, even the current or the past ebola out outbreaks such as here in guinea uh, seven seven or six years ago don't don't really limit the consumption of of bushmeat in the local local populations and urban centers our reply in our organization and partners which was at the beginning the the eagle network represented by the PALF and later Aspinall Foundation and even later Jengula Institute and African Parks was uh, the deployment of the sniffer dogs. Because those uh, sniffer dog units were able to accelerate our rate of, uh, rate of success in uh, discovering 
hidden bushmeat being transported within the country and out of the country. Uh, a part of bushmeat, our dogs have been trained to sniff out weapons, ammunition, and of course ivory as well. But the main volume of our seizures and of our intention was bushmeat, either fresh, as here, uh, dead fruit beds, uh, sometimes alive, as here, dwarf crocodiles, uh, but mostly um, smoked, smoked pieces, uh, dissimulated in you know personal luggage and so on. Uh, since the project began in 2014, we've had two, two litters in Congo of the Belgian Malinois dogs. So now we have the second generation already born to, born to Congo. And sometimes the seizures have been really vast. Uh, sometimes we've also targeted specifically on uh, controlling people working in the logging concessions and it it proved to be to, to be a effective way of uh, of discovering uh, for example here ivory bracelets or pangolin scales now this figure shows uh, some of the taxa of mammals which are mostly threatened by the so-called bushmeat bushmeat trade and pangolins up up there are one of the most uh, most threatened by by bushmeat for human consumption uh, primates as well. Mm, up to half of the primates are, are killed uniquely for, for bushmeat trade. In pangolins it's almost 100%. Uh, those four uh, African and especially the three Central African species of pangolins are endangered, not yet critically endangered, not yet critically endangered as the Asian counterparts, uh, but this might unfortunately unfortunately change in the near future as the trade is still going on uh, despite the the ban despite the highest level of protection in congo the pangolins are still be are still being displayed sometimes alive sometimes dead for for the bushmeat trade and of course some people start to trade also in their scales and the destination for the scales is mainly the east asian market uh, Fortunately, some of the, or big proportion of the pangolins are being seized alive, so we are able to, to release, them, release them back to the wild. Uh, and now at the end of the bushmeat uh, part of our presentation, uh, in the background, you can see the African brush, brush tail porcupine, mm, still quite common species, hunt, uh, hunted frequently for the bushmeat and nowadays also for the bezoars. The bezoars, uh, let's say like stomach stones or intestine stones uh, of uh, undigested food and other, other uh, materials are highly valued uh, recently on the East Asian, mainly Indonesian, Malaysian market. And these are my undercover pictures of uh, Malaysian nationals trading in the, in the pangolins, pangolin bezoars. It can be a big threat for those uh, species as well. And of course, uh, when talking about uh, hunting of primates, here, mandrills, gorillas, this is a hand of the silverback of the Western lowland gorilla, or chimpanzees, it brings, uh, it brings also um, the ape or primate or ape babies to the market. In the past, it used to be a uh, a valued byproduct for the hunters and traffickers nowadays because of the awareness campaigns and the repression the number of uh, primate especially ape ape uh, orphans on the market is limited but still even today we can see we can see such uh, heartbreaking images in central africa but uh, thanks to jen goodall institute and other organizations this is still uh, this is going on more and more rarely. Uh, and the reply, the response to the bushmeat hunting, of course, it must be repression, it must be awareness campaigns, but first of all, which I personally believe should be um, development of some alternative source of uh, animal protein and, uh, and employment, respectively. So since the uh, beginning of this year, we are also involved in the uh, creation of an eco-farm uh, 
also in uh, collaboration or being uh, uh, supported by the Czech development agency and we want to produce uh, domestically reared animal meat for for local for local market and we also also participate in uh, in awareness campaigns of course and now for the couple for the last 5 minutes of my presentation briefly about the human wildlife conflict which is going on and now I will leave the Congo Basin and I will move more northwards to southern Chad, northern Cameroon, where clashes between the megafauna and humans uh, appear. Uh, one of our projects which we started to deal with uh, beginning now, 2021, is penetration of hippos, the amphib amphibious hippos, to the farms of local, local farmers in Chad. So we've selected uh, one area with quite heavy disturbances from the from the hippopotamuses on the local small scale small scale farms, and in collaboration with a local NGO which we know from several years ago, we've started to build uh, electric fencing around parts of the of the selected uh, fields. We've selected the most fertile and most valued uh, parts of the land. Uh, encircled them with metallic metallic barriers uh, and the electricity comes from solar fed uh, stations i mean uh, solar panels fed uh, stations uh, we've selected three sites on both sides of the, on both uh, sides of the logon river in southern chad uh, altogether approximately 60 hectares and at the end of the year we will see the final results uh, till now it seems that the fencing is working uh, quite effectively. There are only a few cases of penetrations uh, from the hippopotamuses inside, probably due to some uh, mm -hmm, some failures in uh, in the electricity power or or the the voltage being being uh, uh, present. So what we will try to do this is like a pilot experiment uh, which should. Mm, which should show us whether or not uh, this system works against hippopotamuses and then in the future years we will think more about which parts of the land should we should we protect which part on the other hand uh, we will need to leave for the wildlife use and the hippopotamus passages and so on so this is we are this is a very very first phase of this project uh, not far from that one, from, from that initiative, we are also involved in um, management of, of the wildlife and uh, unfortunately vegetation on the Lake Lere in, uh, in southern Chad. Uh, there is a big threat of the water hyacinth, the Eichhornia crassipes, uh, invasive species originally from South America. Uh, you will probably very, you will be also familiar with that from other parts of the world which is now starting to spread in the lake on the lake and cover substantial patches which can which can be a big threat to the local wildlife and especially to the local relic, relic population of the west uh, west african manatees this is the only place in the whole chat probably an isolated isolated population and we are starting to collect more data about that mm. Of course, we also witnessed some uh, some poaching, low level of poaching probably, uh, but still some poaching uh, because of the oil or the grease, the, the fat layer, which is valued on the black market with local traditional medicine. So with non-invasive methods, collecting of the, of the uh, feces samples and acoustic monitoring, we will try to find out more about the manatees in that lake and uh, take more actions about uh, about that and now our last but already already like traditional activity in chat uh, is the protection of the fields against elephants um, we use the biological beehive fence method which has been being which has been tested in East Africa since uh, six or seven years ago by Lucy King from Save the Elephants. And we've transmitted this knowledge to Central Africa. Uh, 
So we work here in Chad since 2015 with local associations and we transform the local beekeeping in traditional beehives from straw uh, or, or clay and we use uh, more modern methods, the Kenyan top bar hives, which are, which are easily accessible um, for multiple, multiple honey harvesting throughout the year. Uh, and this can also increase, of course, increase the, the yields in honey. Uh, the method is quite simple. You get to encircle the whole field or village uh, by beehives, 10 meters from each other maximum. They are interlinked or interconnected by wire or another, another, another cord. When the elephants uh, try to pass, they, uh, they shake or they sometimes totally destroy the, the beehive. And of course, the bees protect themselves. They protect the hives and attacked at, they attack in vast numbers, thousands of individuals, the, the penetrator. Uh, so far, this project works, uh, works very well. Local people are are happy that uh, we brought them a little source of incomes in in the form of honey, and uh, each year we multiply. We don't multiply. We increase the number of uh, of fields and communities which are involved to that project. So still looking for some new uh, new collab collaborations on the local scale and new source of finances finances to to accelerate uh, such a project. Well, that was uh, in short what we've been doing in Central Africa uh, since, uh, since now nearly 10 years and I will now be available for your questions, remarks and, uh, and discussions. Have a wonderful time and uh, my kind greetings back to Czech Republic. Ah, okay. Ah, so thank you for, for your presentation, Arthur. <laughs> it's been uh, very dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Lots of interesting work. So mm -hmm. now we open the room to, to ah. questions. Uh -huh. So anyone having questions? Okay. So we have one. Hi, Arthur. <laughs> oh. Who is here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> After I would love to ask if you see any changes in uh, bushmeat consumption after the COVID time. If you can say even now this change or not, or if you see any differences. Uh, it's uh, pretty uh, tough to evaluate all the trends uh, going on now within the last year or two. And for my personal impression, but as I said, this is not uh, backed by some hard data. My personal impression is that uh, here in the Congo Basin, uh, there is no like positive effect in the reduction of the bushmeat consumption. Uh, there are several exceptions that some communities, some traders, especially those in the urban centers, tend to avoid some species like uh, pangolins. So maybe in the top restaurants in, in the city center, Brazzaville or Kinshasa, they, there would be less pangolins uh, uh, available, you know, for the, for the higher, high clientele. But it doesn't mean that the um, hunting level of pangolins is, has been decreased because of that, because of course the, the hunter can uh, either consume it uh, on his own or he can uh, sell it to the local market. So th there are maybe some minor changes uh, but uh, not a drastic decrease. But it will be better to consult some long-term studies carried out by WCS or African parks in in this part of the world to be more to be more accurate. But I, I, I as far as I'm aware, uh, there are very few few up-to-date evidence about this. Um, which partners do you uh, cooperate with? I mean, with the government or other NGOs? Or, and as a, another question is, what is the biggest challenge for you to, uh, to operate in, in this part of Africa? What is the biggest challenge maybe now for you? Mm -hmm. 
the scale or the range of our partners is pretty vast. Um, let's say that on the when talking about the repression about the undercover investigations, it is mainly done in collaboration with the Eagle Network, uh, which is an international NGO based in Kenya, uh, working in Central and West Africa. Uh, we also um, collaborate with the local state institutions, notably the Gendarmerie, so like the police force and the Ministry of uh, Environment, let's say. Uh, but this is only on punctual um, level, level, I mean, punctual operations, investigations, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, on the long term basis, and, and now talking about uh, the sniffer dog project, we've been collaborating, uh, especially with the Jane Goodall Institute here in Congo, and uh, the African Park Network, uh, represented by the Odzala, Odzala Kokoa National Park here. Um, while some other projects, especially those who are uh, recent or, 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 you know, or new in our portfolio of activities, uh, the camera trapping, the, um, I mean, other forms of biomonitoring and the, the human wildlife mitigation or human wildlife conflict mitigation things that we collaborate with smaller NGOs, locally based organizations of uh, you know local people trying to do to some change in their environment and these organizations are acknowledged by local governments uh, here in congo or north in chad so we we create partnerships with them uh, officially or non-officially on a personal basis and we we support them in their activities by our know-how by our materials to certain extent, extent by our finances and also human, I mean, manpower, uh, our volunteers or experts in the fields, in the field. And the biggest challenge, yes, and the main challenge is the steady, steady need of improvisations of all levels you can imagine. It's a, a very unstable environment to work here. Uh, the collaborations with, um, especially the I mean, government structures is nothing easy to be carried out from the you know from the desk uh, um, just it's an, it's another style of of communication and uh, one has to be very very patient uh, and passionate about what he's doing otherwise he would lose the courage and motivation very soon and this is what i actually see around that uh, many people newcomers or enthusiastic people coming here to this part of the world uh, sooner or later they they give up because the the system here is really not functioning well uh, it's functioning somehow of course uh, but uh, through different uh, liaisons and links some of them are like corruption link of, of course but also on the good side um, we have to find our, our solutions than we are used to used to um, used for in in europe or like the western part of the world One of the goals of the conference uh, in Glasgow uh, was to stop deforestation up to 2030 all over the world. What do you think that will happen in Congo Basin and Africa as you know in practice? Will something happen according to this? Yes, uh, that's a it, it's a wonderful opportunity to to create to um, push. Uh, some other and bigger changes and uh, what we see now in the neighboring uh, Gabon uh, which is a country um, comparable in size human population um, and many other figures uh, to Congo which which I'm mainly talking about uh, so Gabon has uh, its own system of uh, wildlife management of uh, protected area management everything is under one agency which makes uh, the issue pretty easier than than here in congo uh, but in general they have very sim I mean, they have uh, a lot of similarities uh, with congo and uh, what they now um, what they are now doing is that uh, they've been receiving uh, substantial amounts of money from uh, western donors Specifically, it was Norway which donated first chunk of a huge amount, the first part of one, 150 or 160 uh, million US dollars. 
and uh, this is to ensure better protection of the forest and continue in the good practice meaning that uh, gabon of course is is exploiting the forests but in a let's say sustainable way or near to sustainable way uh, there is still space to improve of course um, and the logging going on there um, not and now not talking about some uh, exceptional errors and uh, bad practices but in general they they do selective logging or they really control the amount the the, the species composition the diameter of the of the of the timber exploited from the forest and uh, the international community and norway in this case particularly uh, tried to support such a good practice by donating money uh, to improve conservation and uh, um, controlling mechanism in this country. So what I expect, if this uh, concept will prove to be successful and a win-win situation for both sides, we might see this happening in other countries as well. Um, Congo also, I mean, now we're talking about Congo Brazzaville, um, vast majority of the forest forestry forest covered surface is uh, divided into logging concessions uh, i think yeah there was a map of it in my presentation and uh, in most of them there is a big space for for improvements so from my perspective uh, i expect uh, that maybe some new protected areas with no human touch will will appear that will be wonderful but already the the the, the steady i mean the the current number and uh, total size of the protected area areas is not bad you know it it's like a big uh, big percentage big proportion of the countries so if this is uh, really grasped uh, responsibly and if those neighboring forests are managed are managed in a more sustainable way via sustainable selective logging that would be a solution to yeah to um, to, um, to, to enable the, the, the wildlife to sustain here. Uh, of course, there are countries which are very problematic, looking uh, across the river to DRC, Democratic Congo, or Central African Republic. I really have, I'm not entitled to, to preview what will happen there because these are very, very difficult countries. Thank you for these questions, and I, I admit that because of lack of lack of time, I, I I didn't say everything what I what I wanted to say regarding these last projects, the the human wildlife mitigations. Um, the the beekeeping has been a traditional activity to some ethnic groups in southern Chad, uh, using some traditional methods uh, like duck out. Uh, uh, pumpkins, uh, the calabas or the straw hives, uh, or using, of course, uh, natural cavities to, uh, you know, for the for the bees, and then <clears throat> once in a while collect the honey. Uh, none of it has been really done in a manner which which would uh, enable to harvest twice or or multiple times the same hive. So it always required destruction of the beehive or the bee colonies, taking all the honey and you know chase them away. So um, it has been problematic and only known to several ethnic groups and several individuals. Uh, despite the big in incentives in honey, because uh, the price is really uh, high and uh, steadily increasing, comparable to prices in the Czech Republic, for instance. Uh, so we've transformed the way of of using honey uh, honeybees uh, so we've introduced the new type of hives and usually on the community level 
we've selected individuals who are, who are interested to participate and we've given them the the starting needs the materials you know we provided the the, the wood which is uh, also a limiting factor in chat uh, it has to be uh, maybe in the future using another material would be better but uh, wood is pretty expensive in in, in this country and uh, then when when the barrier around a selected part of the of the community land has been has been erected and colonized uh, usually very often within two weeks most of the most of the beehives are really colonized naturally we don't have to introduce them artificially we just wait and the bees come in which is which is a wonderful wonderful uh, feature and uh, uh, we have a local collaborator uh, from the veterinary background uh, like our field field agent which is who, who is monitoring the successes in general we can say that uh, the yields of honey from this new or the modernized type of uh, beehive uh, is double or triple than the previous yields from the traditional hives and it is much easier to collect you know so it has multiple advantages and the bees uh, remain there if, if, when it's properly done if you don't really destroy it uh, excessively so in terms of honey production definitely yes and in terms of uh, mitigation of the penetrating elephants as i said we lack hard data because the the area is really remote uh, usually those people don't have cell phones our field agent uh, he cannot be everywhere at the same time so mm, many of the evidence are anecdotal unfortunately so we cannot really measure it uh, like scientifically uh, as I, I would wish but we have uh, we have, you know, accounts that uh, it has been drastically improved since the since the beehives are there. But of course, we have also other issues. Uh, the region is ethnically not uh, unified, and they are uh, apart from those sedentary agriculturists. We have nomadic herders, like a Fulani or or Arabic tribes, uh, uh, grazing their 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 uh, stock uh and they, they, their cattle and they regularly destroy the sometimes the hives uh, because the bees also attack uh, cattle uh, or they steal the they steal the wire or they just destroy the fencing because i i love the people uh in general but in some situations they are problematic because they don't understand why the barrier is there and uh, uh, they can just detour it so it will require more more work on this community level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you about the ostriches as an alternative to the bushmi. I didn't uh, notice whether this was in Chad or in Congo, but I think that the ostriches are more like savanna species. Can they be bred in in the humid conditions of Congo or? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, this project, which we now, uh, we, which we are starting, is in, in the Congo, um, uh, indeed, uh, in the southern part of the Congo, which is, as you can see on the satellite image, predominant, pre predominantly covered by savanna, and the precipit, the precip precipitation rate is also not huge. It's like 1,200, 1,000, uh, you know, uh, 300 millimeters per year. There is quite a long uh, dry season. And uh, from experience uh, from other countries, Malaysia, Brazil, Nigeria, uh, ostriches can thrive well uh, also in more humid uh, conditions than usual. So we are placing the project here. Of course, uh, it would be maybe easier, maybe even more, um, maybe the production of ostriches would be faster and more with easier in Chad or in more savanna or more Sahel like environment but the problem there is that uh, we would have hard times in uh, in uh, being able to sell the meat for good price which was which would en enable us to run the project because unlike Congo and other equatorial originally forest areas Chad is uh, well known to to have like tenfold more cattle than human population there is like 
surplus of uh, of meat from uh, beef, uh, goats, camels, uh, etc., etc. So the problem there is not the lack of meat itself. The the problem there is lack of uh, uh, good distribution or a fair distribution. Uh, you know, and I would talk more about it, but it's a, it's a complicated story. So we we place the project here to Congo because mm. here there really there is the lack of uh, meat. People people want to to buy it. They just don't have alternatives. Yeah, it's true that ostriches can thrive well even in our conditions. So even in snow, you know. Yeah, even in yeah, snow. So yeah. we believe we, we believe it's a viable viable method. And now uh, I'm here actually, especially to to move this project for, forward. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. Just really fast, fast question. Really fast. <laughs> I just was thinking that you mentioned that you have the fancy, the electricity fancy for people, and it's for solar panel, if I'm right. So if, if uh, people don't steal the, the solar panel, because in Indonesia, usually if they place the solar panel for some lamps or whatever, so people will just steal it. Yeah, of course, there is a threat of that. But so far, since the beginning in May, uh, those solar panels are there. One of them has been somehow destroyed by by a lightning, probably. But it, it was not; it was a natural cause. We've been re re we've replaced it, and uh, so far, so good. It works, and yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, and, and thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you for the invitation and enjoy the I can't be there I, I have to run to the field right now and uh, uh, I'll be happy to see the presentations later if possible so it was clearly a, a very interesting talk and, and there might be many more questions in the minds of, of all people but what we can do is to collect them and, and maybe contact you maybe tomorrow can be <laughs> <laughs> but anyway thank you very much